demo part. That's absolutely fine by me. Yep. Uh, just let me know when you want me to hit uh, kill, and we'll get uh, done with that then. I think I did a pretty good job at sanitizing my presentation itself, but the uh, the demo definitely has got IP addresses and stuff in it. So. Well, if, if there's a need to go back through and edit and blur, I am perfectly okay with that as well. Excellent. So, uh, asterisk, uh, I, don't, I don't know how people say this, uh, daddy, daddy, uh, D-A-H-D-I, uh, Cisco voice, and dial-up. Uh, these are the topics I'm going to be covering tonight. My name is Matthew Ross. Uh, my, my background on this is kind of interesting. Uh, I start, I was born in 87, so when I got internet, it was dial-up. So I started with dial-up. Uh, I then became part of Computer Users Group, Central Iowa Computer Users Group. Uh, and gosh, nine, 1998, 1999, uh, and back then they had a T1 line. So I was interested in the, in how that worked. And I kind of learned a little bit about, about it back then, but I dropped off and did other things as I became a teenager. Uh, so just a couple of years ago in 2019, I graduated from DMAC for, uh, telecommunications. So this is, this is kind of my jam anyways. Uh, so when I got out of school, uh, had I had a final project, I kind of, I, I skipped the last semester because I tested out of it. But uh, had I had a final project, this likely could have been it. Uh, I am connecting dial-up through VOIP back uh, to the phone network, back through VOIP, and then back into the dial-up server. Uh, so I'm starting with the modem. Uh, I guess we'll go straight to the end here. I'm starting with a modem at my computer and ending at a bulletin board. That is the objective for tonight. So going back up to the top, uh, overview of what we'll talk about. Terminology, uh, a little bit of history, some examples of dial-up, the hardware overview, uh, networking overview, uh, showing you, you know, what's plugged into what, uh, the configuration portion uh, for asterisks, uh, and then Cisco, and then the patent box, which is the thing that actually serves the dial-up, uh, and then a demo, uh, which I'm actually currently giving myself a little demo right now, making sure it works. I'm at uh, the second time through at about five minutes in, so it's working working like a champ. I think we'll have a success tonight. Uh, and then some other topics that I might consider in the future. So terminology, uh, run through this quick. Telegraph, telephone is tele is at, at a distance. Graph is for writing, phone is for audio. So that's kind of a, that's what it's all about. Asterisk obviously is a open source software for telephony on uh, that's built for Linux. Uh, DAHDI is Digium Asterisk Hardware Device Interface. So this is drivers and software for actual hardware that interfaces with asterisk. Uh, a modem is a modulator, demodulator. A codec is a coder, decoder. Uh, POTS, plain old telephone service. Uh, PSTN is the public switch telephone network. Uh, you know, like the internet would be, the PSTN is the internet for phones. Uh, dial plan is network routes for phone numbers. This one will be uh, important towards the end of the presentation because uh, routing when it comes to phone systems is pretty important and that all has to do with dial plan. Uh, VOIP is voice over internet protocol, what we're doing tonight. SIP is the actual protocol that VOIP goes over. Um, it is what handles the signaling uh, to start your phone conversation. The actual conversation is done over RTP, but the signaling uh, saying, you know, hello, uh, okay, uh, responding back and forth to initiate the actual phone call. That's all done in SIP. Uh, a trunk, obviously you guys know what a trunk is. Well, they have trunks for phones as well. Uh, and a PBX, a phone branch exchange. Uh, hardware behind phone routing. Uh, so like we have network switches, there's huge telephone switches. Uh, a couple of them are the Nortel DMS 100, which they so happen to have one at DMAC. Uh, I actually got some experience with the Nortel and the AT&T 4ESS. Uh, those are some big telephone switches. Uh, these would be placed either, they have large class five switches, which will be placed regionally, or they have class four switches, which will be placed in like uh, cities. 
Um, so a little bit of history. Uh, telegraphy was first mentioned, uh, somebody mentioned it in a newspaper uh, in 1753. So uh, telegraphy, communication over electronic means that has been around for a long time. In the 1830s, there's some patents involved. What is this you sent here? Oh, yep. There you go. Yep, I learned about that. Uh, in the 1830s, patents were uh, created about uh, about telegraphy, specifically the actual uh, devices that you use to to manually input the telegraph to the other side. That's what was getting patented. Uh, in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, patented the telephone, or uh, or it could have been this other guy had he had a rich uh, rich girlfriend's dad to do the things for him. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell was dating someone whose father was a lawyer and had money, so he decided to go and uh, patent this for him rather quickly uh, to try to beat this other guy out. Um, there's some controversy over it. If you want to read into that, there's a lot to it. Uh, there's the patent number as well, if you want to see the original patent. Uh, so after the patent was made, uh, Bell Telephone Company was created. And you guys know about Bell probably. Uh, and it's a breakup eventually in 1982. Well, there's a couple of decisions that led to that. Uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act was made in what, the early 1900s uh, as a way to prevent monopolies. Uh, Bell was allowed to have have a monopoly on it because it was a natural monopoly, I believe. Um, there's a whole lot to it, but the most important things is later on uh, with the Sher Sherman antitrust laws became two different uh, problems. The Husha phone from 1956, which is literally just a cup that went over the earpiece so that people couldn't hear you. Other people couldn't listen to your conversation when they were in the same room. Uh, a purely analog, non-electronic device that had nothing to do with the phone system. Uh, eventually, AT &T, an AT&T lawyer saw it in a store display window and decided to go ahead and sue them over it, uh, saying that allowing other devices on the network that they owned was not allowed. Uh, later on, the Carter phone came around, and this was a device that allowed you to connect a radio to a phone service. Uh, well, AT&T didn't like that being connected to their phone networks either, so they sued, tried to sue that out of existence. And instead, uh, it turned, turned, got turned around on them, and now we have the right to hook up things to our telephones, uh, things that we own ourselves. We don't have to buy a telephone from the telephone company. Uh, it used to be that you had to buy the telephone uh, or rent a telephone even from them, as well as pay for the service, uh, but that that changed in 1968 with the Carter phone decision. <clears throat> so after we could connect our own devices to it, uh, there were modems that started becoming a popular thing. Uh, the first modem uh, protocol was the Bell 101 protocol. And this was obviously created by Bell Laboratories in 1958. That was capable of doing 110 baud. Uh, the Bell 103A protocol was developed in 1962 at 300 baud. Bell 202 at 1976 was over 1,000 baud at 1,200 BPS. Uh, we're changing from baud to uh, bits per second now because baud indicates a symbol rate, whereas uh, we switched from uh, frequency uh, frequency shift keying to phase shift modulation. Uh, so we're using a lot, we're using symbols differently, but we're getting 1200 bits per second out of it. Uh, so in 1984, V22 BIS uh, was created. This is actually a little bit farther along because V22 started first. Uh, 1984 at 2400 bits per second. As you can see, this uh, V22 is actually an ITU recommendation. Uh, which became as a standardized thing. And you guys know about standards and how wonderful they are. Uh, sometimes they can be a pain to adhere to, but it makes it so that people can enter, uh, work interoperability, you know, so that people can work together. Instead of having a bunch of different manufacturers making their own things, everybody can make the same thing, uh, can communicate together. So uh, 
V27, another ITU standard made in 1988 at 400 or 4,800 bits per second. Uh, V32 at 9,600 in 1988. Uh, V32 BIS in 1991 at 14,400. Uh, V34 in 1994 at 28,800. Uh, I think I started somewhere in between here at 91 and 90, 94. So I remember having a 14.4 modem, but we didn't have it for long. And then we upgraded straight, I believe, to 33.6 was our next step. Uh, so V34, 1994, uh, uh, I think this is actually V34 BIS that I meant to type here in 1996, at a little bit upgrade of 33.6K. And then in 1998, we got V90, which was capable of 56K download and 33.6K upload. The reason why we were able to do this is by means of compression. Uh, we, uh, we upgraded that compression in 2000 to 56K download and 48K upload. Uh, the difference between all of the ones before V90 and V90 and V92 being the compression link capability of going past 33.6K. If you have two modems, and you connect them together, like without a phone line, you can just connect the phone line from one modem to the other. You can get them to dial each other, but they'll only ever dial each other at 33.6 because they don't have the compression for downstream like servers would. Uh, I, I have that problem solved. So, a couple of cool demos. Uh, we'll see a video that it shows this in just a second. This is a, the time frame of a the initiation of a dial-up call, uh, starting with this very beginning portion here. This is dual tone multi-frequency or DTMF. That's phone numbers. You're typing in the phone number right here. You can see that it's dual tone because there's actually two uh, two lines here. One is one tone, one is the other. Combined, you hear them, uh, but they are two separate distinct tones. Uh, that's also how people hack the phone networks networks when they were uh, hacking phone networks long ago, is they would find these tones that weren't capable of being dialed uh, by a dial pad, and they'd build their own dial pad that was capable of dialing these uh, to get free calls, you know, free toll calls and whatnot. Uh, but that's besides the point. So headphone users beware, I will be initiating a, a, a dial-up call here. I, there's at least two of you with headphones, so I'm going to try to turn it down quick. There's the dials. And this is pretty cool because you can see each portion. So the actual not, you have to share sound. Audio. Okay, you have to click right. in view options at the top or they're like, yeah, sharing options and, and share audio. None of us can hear anything. Okay. Well, I assumed you heard everything for me talking until now, right? Yeah. 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 You can hear everything okay. that you were saying, just yeah. not the computer audio. <laughs> My thing. At the top of your screen, there should be an option that says like share computer audio. Yeah, it's in the green bar or uh, whatever color bar it is on the screen sharing. I see stop share. That's it. Mm, uh, we can't see it, can we? No, we can't. Yeah. because no, I'm only sharing. I'm only sharing just. My There's like a little screen. arrow, I think, on the far right or something. Um. What about bottom left of Zoom? Fair and sense. Does it say it join audio? More. It was in more. It was in more. I had to click on the hamburger menu. OK, Great. let's try, let's try this again. OK, uh, let's call it the hamburger. Uh, turn it up just a little bit. I don't want to. I would definitely suggest going back through this and watching it in slow motion because it's pretty cool on how much stuff actually goes through there. Uh, obviously, you can see that the digits being dialed is just, there's so much stuff that ha happens right there just in the tiny bit of the beginning. Uh, it'd be interesting to make one of those myself as well. So I'll include the links uh, in the chat. Uh, and then the second thing, this is going to be important going on. The previous graph also showed this. Oh, shoot. 
you can see uh, the time is obviously the scrolling, but the width of it, it goes from 100 to about 4,000. And that's because that is the width in hertz of voice uh, is about 4,000 hertz. Uh, Kind of cool how much of the spectrum it uses there at the end as it actually trains uh, for compression. So a little bit more background, uh, pulse code modulation. So 4,000 Hertz, uh, the, the frequency of voice, uh, you double that because of the Nyquist theorem, which I'm not getting it into here, uh, 8,000 samples. That's how often you should sample to get an accurate representation of, of so pulse code mo modulation is turning uh, analog voice into digital digital data. Uh, so we're turning this 4,000 hertz worth of audio uh, into digital data so that it can be transmitted by a, whatever means of computer. Uh, 8,000 samples, so that's going to be the across, the time, uh, and then eight bits of quantization. Uh, so which value is it going to pick based on how high or, high or low the wave is? Uh, so 8,000 samples times 8 bits equals 64 kilobits per second. Okay, that's going to be important. Uh, so the codecs involved that adhere to this uh, are U-law and A-law. These are both pulse code modulation. Uh, a WAV file, I'm sure you guys have experienced WAV files before. Uh, those are also pulse code modulation. Uh, T1 also uses this same technology. Uh, it's just, just plain, very basic pulse code modulation. Uh, this has been in use since uh, whenever the AT&T 4 ESS switches came out, which was like the 70s. So as long as we've had dial-up, this has been the backbone of how dial-up works. Uh, so T1, a little bit of background here, 24 channels of what we were just talking about of 64 kilobytes per channel. Uh, 24 channels, eight bits per channel, 8,000 frames sampled per second. Uh, plus, this is the important part, one framing bit at 8,000 frames per second uh, equals one, uh, five through six for all the 24 channels, plus the signaling at 8,000 bits per second. This is how you get the 1.544 megabits per second from a T1 line. That's exactly how it's calculated. Uh, now, when it comes to T1, you can separate those out into 24 voice channels, or you can use them all bundled together as 24 or as a single data channel. Or you can separate them out all funky and take two of them at a time and turn them into ISDN. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, silly stuff you can do with T1 that I don't know how to do yet. So the hardware for this project tonight, uh, I've got two, two of these servers, but only one of them doing the, doing the stuff. Uh, the Dell R210 there, it's got a uh, Asterisk 16.24.0, that's the latest version of Asterisk 16 branch, uh, plus the developmental branch of DAHDI. Uh, you asked, what doesn't work? What's not backwards compatible? And this is one of them. Uh, the old versions of DAHDI just do not compile on new kernels. I couldn't get anything to work. I literally had to use the latest developmental branch to get it uh, built. I'm using like Ubuntu, whatever latest uh, Ubuntu uh, LTS version is, and it, it just did not work. So that was kind of a pain. Um, getting into building it from source is something I'd like to get to, but not tonight. Uh, the card that is inside of the PC is a Digium TE420. Uh, it is a PCI Express X2. It has four spans of T1, and included inside of it, I also have an echo canceller card. Uh, so it's a pretty fancy piece of hardware. Uh, the box right underneath that's actually the patent. I should have done these in order the way they're in the rack. We'll talk about the patent next since. The red box, that is a remote access server. It has T1 ports as its connection for the phone lines, and it has a single 10100 uh, port for Ethernet to connect it to the IP network. Uh, so, and then this is something that I just, just recently added. It turns out I found somebody else that's doing the same exact thing as I have here. 
uh, randomly without any involvement from me. He set this up completely independently. Uh, some guy in Texas. Uh, I got a hold of the guy. I emailed him. He gave me a call and I talked to him a bit about it for a bit. His system worked a lot better than mine. And the reason was is because he was providing his T1 ports with the Cisco box. Uh, so he sent me his config, uh, showed me a little bit of how he set it up and I changed mine over to this. Uh, so technically I'm not even using my Digium card anymore, uh, but I do have it set up still so that I can use different routes uh, with dial plans to go different ways. Uh, and also, yeah, not pictured is I have a cloud VOIP provider. There's, they are who connects me to the cloud uh, phone network, to the phone network via the internet. And I also have a server in the inter on the internet, a cloud machine uh, that is providing me an Astra server on the cloud. Uh, so that way, in case my internet here goes, goes down, all my phones can still get, uh, still get service at least go to voicemail. Okay, so this is how all this crazy stuff is plugged in, except for I forgot to add the modems. I actually, the modems that you see in my video right here, uh, these are not in this. Uh, they would be connected to the internet. Uh, you see the blue ethernet cord. We'll just imagine that's plugged into the internet. Uh, that's how I'm gonna be dialing up. We can also dial up from these patent, the patent server here. But uh, so my Dell connects to the internet, uh, to my router, whatnot. It goes out to the internet. Uh, the patent box only goes to the switch, but it also connects via T1 to the uh, Dell computer and the Cisco, everything connects to everything via T1. The dotted lines are T1, the solid lines are ethernet here. Uh, the one thing to note here is two of these lines, uh, the blue dotted lines are not voice lines. I think, I think those are the ones. Uh, as it turns out, I don't actually have enough DSPs available to handle that many phone calls on the Cisco box. So while it has 41 ports, uh, you can only use two of them at a time as voice. So to get all this stuff configured, uh, there's three important, the most important configuration files for uh, DAHDI. Uh, assigned spans, it maps the hardware devices to the actual uh, T1 spans, uh, whatever you want to call them virtually on the computer. Uh, ETC DHDI modules. Uh, this is a list of drivers to load on boot. Uh, the way that it works, it, it, sends, it sets up a blacklist file in ETC modprobe.d uh, to blacklist everything that's related to it. And then it loads its own stuff in order that it wants it to so that the naming comes up properly. Uh, it's kind of a royal pain in the butt. Uh, I've only ever used it on one card at a time, so I've never really had a problem, but there are some people that have, you know, just like lines of these PCI cards in their computer. So trying to make sure that the naming is correct is pretty important, I guess. So I don't know why they did it, but I'm pretty sure it's important. Uh, but it's important to keep that in note because you'll wonder why your drivers aren't loading and that's because they're blacklisted by default. Uh, and then etc DHDI system.com. Uh, this selects the hardware encoding type, T1 channel layout and echo cancellation options. So uh, examples of these, uh, sign spans, you can see the uh, PCI uh, location. And then at the end, uh, one, one, one. So this is span one, uh, ports one, uh, gosh, it starts at one and no, no, PCI device one. No, I can't remember how these go. Uh, this file is generated automatically by a utility that's uh, given with it's the DAHDI tools package versus the DAHDI Linux package. Uh, the, the DAHDI gen conf is what creates all these files. Uh, so you likely will not have to do this by hand, but you can see port one, port 25, port 49, and port 73. Uh, that is the first port. Uh, this would be one, and then it goes up to 24. 
Uh, this is 25 and it goes up to 48. Uh, 49 goes up to 72 and 73 goes up to 96. So that's all, all four spans of 24 channels uh, for that card. Uh, modules, this is the only one that's required for the card that I have. It's the WCT4XXP. And then system.conf, there's actually four of these sections, but uh, I cut it down for size. Uh, once again, span 110. Uh, then ESF is extended super frame is what this stands for. That is the encoding type of T1 uh, that you're trying to send over the line. Uh, the same thing applies to the B8ZS. It's, uh, this has to do, uh, I did this in school. It has to do with uh, how data gets sent over the line, whether it's every eighth bit that gets replaced uh, for the data that you want. There's a few different versions of it, but basically everybody in the US has used this for years. Uh, but you'll see these two options pop up in the configurations on the other devices here in a minute. Uh, so B-chan, these are your voice channels. Uh, and D-chan, that's your data channel. So these are your uh, voice channels that you actually send the voice traffic over. And your data channel has all your signaling, initiation of phone calls, uh, picking up, hanging up, uh, call waiting, caller ID, all that good noise. Uh, and then echo canceler options. Now, it's kind of weird. I'm not sure what to do with VOIP yet. Some things say turn it off. Some things say turn it on. Uh, it seems to be the case that if you have hardware echo cancellation, you should use it. Uh, and if you don't, then you shouldn't try software. Uh, I do have a hardware echo canceler in this though, so I'm using it. Uh, and then you can select which, which channels that you want to use it on. So the asterisk portion of it. So that's just DAHDI. These two, that's just the driver connecting the, the T1 hardware to the PC. Uh, so asterisk, that's the actual phone software that creates the phone branch exchange where, you know, it handles incoming and outgoing phone calls trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. Uh, the three or four, four things that are important, amongst the things that are important uh, here, uh, chandhdi.conf. Uh, I've got a sample of that in a second, I'll show you. Uh, and it's options on how, how that card interfaces with asterisks and what, where the context of those calls should go. Uh, ETC asterisk extensions.conf. Uh, this is your routing tables, but for phone calls. Uh, etc asterisk iax.conf. This is uh, something that I used for an asterisk to asterisk trunk. iax stands for inter asterisk exchange. Uh, so instead of using SIP to uh, transfer my calls between my local phone branch exchange that's here at home and my one that's in the cloud, I decided to use iax because it's got less, uh, less overhead. Uh, hopefully to speed up the speed up the call. Uh, so etc asterisk pjsip.conf. Uh, first noting that pjsip.conf is the new way of doing things. Uh, asterisk when it began, use sip.conf with a different kind of sip driver made by somebody else. Uh, recently they've switched to pjsip, a different Im implementation of sip and that's what they use now. So, but this actually sets up your accounts. Uh, what accounts are connecting to you and what accounts you are connecting to. Uh, so it, that includes accounts and trunks. Okay, so your Chan DHDI, there's just a couple of options. Uh, select your group, uh, what group it belongs to, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, what context it belongs to, and that'll be part of the dial plans. Uh, you can have separate routing tables uh, for the separate contexts uh, that exist within your system. Uh, it's kind of important to know that because when I went to the Cisco device, it doesn't have context. Uh, everything is all treated, treated as the one, the same thing. Uh, so switch type, that's what kind of, uh, what kind of networking switch, what kind of T1 hardware you're trying to emulate, whether it's a Nortel DMS 100 or it's the AT&T 4 ESS switch, or there's a few other kinds of switches but this is the actual phone carrier that you're emulating. So that's where you pick this right here. Uh, and as you can see, I'm using the Nortel DMS 100. Uh, signaling, uh, this is either Pry CPE or Pry Net. Uh, Pry CPE is customer premise equipment. So it's the client 
in a T1 network, uh, whereas primary next is the uh, or prim primary rate ISDN underscore net is what that would stand for, is I'm emulating the network side. So I'm actually emulating this switch here. Uh, once again, we got to make sure we set echo cancel to yes. Uh, this is selecting these channels that are belonging to this group up here. And then I don't know why I have a context default in there still, but uh, I should probably get rid of that. Uh, so ix.conf, this is pretty simple. Simple. If you go to set up ix yourself, it's basically about the same thing that you're going to see here. Uh, if you Google it and go look up the basic intro to it, it's very, very simple. Uh, on one side, you say side, side one, side two. One side registers the other with an IP address. Uh, the other side has, uh, you know, authentication for it. Very, very simple. The most important thing here, though, is the allow. Uh, we're only going to allow ULaw and ALaw as as voice codecs to be used here, uh, and the context here from IAX. So asterisk pjsip.com. So. Uh, this is an example. Obviously, this isn't my real one because I wouldn't use that password. Uh, but this sets up all your endpoints, uh, who's connecting to you. Uh, in a similar fashion, not exactly like this, you would also connect to your trunks, how you connect out to other people. So whereas my, my link between my two PPXs is IAX, me to the cloud provider is actually PJSIP. So it would go in this section. Uh, bunch of fanciness, but as you can see, it's actually pretty basic. If you're trying to set it up uh, just for the most basic things, there's not much to it. Uh, most important thing here, once again, making sure that you pick the codec, uh, ULaw, ALaw. So ULaw is for the US, ALaw is the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, yeah, so extensions.conf. So this is the routing that goes on with phone networks. Uh, it can get pretty, pretty confusing. And that is why I definitely didn't include my uh, actual working configuration because it is a mess. Uh, it would take forever to explain to you. Uh, so each one of these headers is one of those contexts that you saw uh, back in pjsip.conf where it's got uh, context from Cisco or ix.com where it's got context from IAX or uh, chandady.com where it's got uh, context from PSTN. Uh, all of those are listed inside of extensions conf. So if you want to route something from one of these extensions, you would put that information for that routing inside of that, uh, that portion. Uh, you can also include multiple contexts uh, in a single context with each other, or you can include context uh, however you want, really. Uh, it's a computer. You can tell it what to do. Uh, it's pretty cool. So extension, this is just how it works. Uh, prepending, so it has to start with uh, n is 2 through 9. Uh, so, if, well, 1 can't be here. Uh, xx is 0 through 9. Uh, another 2 through 9, and then 0 through 9 for all these digits. This is the first item that should be picked uh, in this. It's, 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 you can have an order uh, of things. So for instance, I would have extend nxxxxxxxxx2, uh, and that would be the second option. And maybe I want to hang up the call after it's done, or maybe I want it to dial to uh, I don't know, something else afterwards, like you, I want you to take a survey afterwards. It's a, so it goes that in a chronological order, line by line. Uh, you can also point things around by uh, selecting, oh gosh, there's, there's all sorts of ways this, this could be done. I could spend an entire day or an entire meeting talking just about dial plans and how they work, uh, but so dial, obviously, you know what dialing is. Uh, this is going to call, if it reaches any number with a 10-digit pattern, uh, starting with 2 through 9 and with the fourth digit 2 through 9, it will dial uh, the IX2 trunk uh, side 1 to whatever extension you're dialing. Because you're dialing a phone number. Uh, this is telling it where to go, but this is telling you what phone number you're calling once it gets there. Uh, 
So this would be your gateway, so to say, for IP networking, and this would be the IP address that you're trying to reach. Uh, and obviously, this is a variable here. You can insert whatever you want there. Uh, so incoming calls from, so this is when my cloud provider brings me a phone call. Uh, it goes to my cloud PBX. My cloud PBX sends it in via IAX2, and then it picks it up here. Uh, the from PSTN is when box come or calls come in. Oh shoot. When calls come in from the T1 lines on the hardware card, uh, they will pretty much do the same exact thing as they did last time uh, with the same conditions. But this is only from, from PSTN, so those are only things that are considered in the Chan DHDI. Uh, and the last one, from IAX. Uh, this, let's see here. Oh no, from Cisco, this was from my, uh, this is from my Cisco box, dialing across my IAX trunk out to my cloud PBX to go outbound. The from IAX, this is inbound calls. And when coming calls from, this is why I included the comments from my, uh, from my actual configs. Uh, incoming calls from the IX2 trunk, public PBX. So this is why I've got the plus one, my actual phone provider that gives me phones from the, or phone calls from the actual public switch telephone network. They provide a plus one at the beginning of the call. So that's why it's added here. Uh, so I can make sure to match those calls, but then I can dial it out uh, via PJ SIP uh, and then just picking a phone number so that my Cisco box will pick it up on its dial plans. Uh, but then at Cisco to send it out to the Cisco uh, endpoint here in pjsip.conf. Uh, and then the other one, I've got this commented out because I'm not using this route currently, uh, is to dial out to the T1 line via the hardware interface. So people can call in from IAX, uh, and if it matches this pattern, it can get dialed out this way, or if I change it, it can get dialed out this way. There's lots of different options there. I've made some test phone numbers like 000555, 000, you know, whatever. Uh, some of them work, some of them don't, and I think it has to do with how the modem handles phone numbers. Not entirely sure about that either. Uh, a lot of modems were made separately and differently, and initialization strings are a pain. It's a whole different story there. Okay, so last bit of configuration, the Cisco box. Uh, card type, making it T1 instead of E1, because E1 is 30 channels uh, and is for Europe, whereas T1 is 24 channels and is for the US. Uh, controller T1, 0 slash 0. Then pry group time slots 1 through 24. This actually sets up that controller to be a voice interface instead of a IP interface. Uh, just a couple of simple commands for setting up the IP network on that box. That's pretty simple. If you guys have used a Cisco box before, you can understand that pretty easy. If you've done anything sort of networking before, I'm sure you can understand that. Uh, interface zero, serial zero slash zero uh, colon 23. Uh, you notice this here, this does not describe an interface range except for the entire interface. Uh, it's pointing in the entire interface out at once. So this is speaking for the whole thing. Uh, switch type, primary DMS 100. So this is matching uh, what we had back, oh gosh, way back there now. Uh, this one, it's matching what we've got in the asterisk config. So they're both DMS 100. Oops. Uh, ISDN protocol emulate network. And you're like, wait a minute, the asterisk box is network too. Uh, that's right, because they're both emulating the network because the patent box is emulating the client. Uh, we'll get to that eventually. Uh, ISDN incoming voice modem. This was a, a command that just helped with uh, the clarity of uh, modem calls over voice. So that's pretty much it. Uh, for configuration of the Cisco box, getting the actual network lights up and running, you know, getting a green link light from, from the asterisk box to the Cisco.
so voice service VOIP, this is for the, the SIP portion of the Cisco box. Uh, it's a T1 to SIP gateway, basically. Uh, SIP outbound proxy, that's where voice calls go out to. So that is the local asterisk box that I have. Uh, SIP UA, this is more SIP configuration stuff. Obviously, that's not my real password, but that matches the stuff that was in asterisk uh, PJ SIP conf here. You remember uh, endpoint Cisco or username Cisco password 123. That's how this Cisco box connects to asterisk uh, is with this information here. The same time this last line SIP server is there so that I don't have to type in this information later on in this screen. So this is the dial plan for the Cisco box. Uh, whereas with uh, asterisk, we had separate contexts. Each context could have their own uh, sections where you could dial different things. Uh, the Cisco box, it's all one context. So dial peer voice one VOIP, this is saying VOIP calls. You would think it's saying VOIP calls. Uh, in reality, it's saying this is the most important thing, destination pattern dot T. This is any phone number that's dialed, any phone number at all. If this gets dialed, uh, it's going to get sent out the voice uh, interface or the VOIP interface that the Cisco box has. Uh, it's going to get sent out to the SIP server that was defined here, SIP server. Uh, we're use, going to make sure that we use G711 ULaw because that's ULaw uh, encoding. <clears throat> so we've got the same encoding across the entire line. And then this no VAD is no voice activity detection. Uh, voice activity detection will silence the line if it doesn't hear any noise. Uh, that's not cool for modems. So we're going to turn that off. Then we've got dial peer voice two pots. If it matches this number uh, here, that 515-400-2600, it will go out to the actual T1 port 0 slash 0 colon 23. So it'll get sent out the T1 line. Uh, so any voice call that hits this box will pay attention to both of these patterns here. The problem I was having is I expected these to be two separate uh, contexts, one that only applied to VOIP calls incoming and outgoing, and one that only applied to, to uh, actual uh, analog line calls incoming and outgoing. I didn't understand it, but in reality, this is all one configuration. They all have to do with each other. So if I am dialing outbound from the Cisco, not incoming calls, but outbound, if I dial this phone number, even if it's coming in from this port, it will get sent right back out to this port. Uh, so there's immediate loop back no matter what. That is why this box, they recommend in the dial peer uh, setup guide, you can go look up Cisco's dial peer. They've got just, just a document just on dial peers. Uh, why they recommend using nine for outbound calls is so that you don't get the mix up whether if I want to dial into the server, but I want it to go out to the network, that means I would have to make a dial plan that has separate routes outgoing and incoming. Kind of a pain in the butt. I'm going to find a workaround eventually, but this is how it is for now. So the last thing, configuration for the patent 2960. Yes, it has a web page. Uh, it is HTTP only. Uh, it does have SSH, except for it doesn't have any of the latest and greatest key ciphers. So literally no SSH client will connect to the thing. So I just use uh, a reverse proxy to connect to it. It's a pain in the butt. Uh, you can also telnet to it if you want to. Uh, if that's a possibility if you want to configure this thing. I, I prefer the web UI for this box uh, is, is much better. So we've got uh, this, this first box here. This is the T1 settings. This is what configures the T1. Uh, once again, we can see ESF for extended super frame, B8ZS uh, for the line coding, uh, some options for some advanced options, I would say for both testing uh, and usage, uh, line build out would suggest how long your T1 line is. They have a maximum length, just like, you know, it's 100 meters for a Cat5 cable. I think it's like 3,000 feet or something like that for a T1 cable. Uh, so 
there's some options in there related to that. Uh, the last option that's important on that screen is message oriented switch type DMS. Uh, that's the DMS 100, the Nortel DMS 100 switch. That's what kind of switch it's expecting to connect to. Uh, there's four of these boxes. Each one is for one of the four ports on the box. Uh, I only included one to keep it quick. The other box over here on the right, uh, people that are dialing in, these are the options, uh, how, how they should connect, what kind of modem protocols they can connect at. Uh, as you can see, I've got it set to 300 baud minimum, 64K uh, maximum, although that's a theoretical maximum, you'll never hit it. Uh, and I've got everything from V21 up to V90 turned on. I do not have V92 turned on, so you'll never get 48K uh, upload. So let's see here. I've got some compression options there. Uh, retrain. So you're like, well, this is nice and all, but what the heck when you dial into the patent box, how do you, what does it actually do? And that's what this page is for. Uh, the authentication portion of this, as you can see, I have a couple of things blurred out. Uh, this gives you the different services that you can dial into. Uh, it accepts two different kinds of authentication right now. I've got it set up to text or PAP. Uh, so PAP is something that was included with dial-up networking with Windows. I'm not getting into that because I'm only doing using text-based authentication right now. If you wanted to use like dial-up networking for Windows, you would need to use PAP. Uh, and that's actually what this ID zero is that's blurred out here because I don't want you dial into my network and actually using my IP network. Uh, and that's why it's PPP as well. All these other services, these are all Telnet. Uh, so when you dial my box, it gives you a username and password prompt. And then you can use one of these username and password combos to be sent to one of these IP address and port combinations that will send you to a Telnet server. Uh, yeah, I've got a handful of options here. All of these are bulletin boards, except for the last one, A New Hope. That is the ASCII animation of Star Wars. So this is the route we'll be taking tonight. Uh, you saw at the beginning of it here. So I'm gonna be connecting my computer up to my modems via use of a USB to serial converter. Uh, the modems will be connected to uh, this box right, oops, right there. That's a Cisco SPA 112. It's a analog telephone converter. It kind of does about the same thing, but only with two phone lines, uh, but converts ethernet course, you know, IP networks, uh, SIP protocol, VOIP into two analog phone lines. Uh, those are connected in the modem. So analog phone lines are connected to the cloud, my cloud phone branch exchange via SIP. Uh, my cloud phone branch exchange is connected to my VOIP provider via SIP. Uh, my VOIP provider will send it out to the phone network, whatever, however they do it. I Maybe it's SIP, maybe it's T1. I can't really guess that because I don't own their equipment. Uh, it'll come back in through the public switch telephone network back to my VOIP provider since I'm just calling myself. Uh, it'll go back to my cloud uh, phone branch exchange via SIP. It will go from my cloud phone branch exchange to my local phone branch exchange that I've got here in my server rack via IAX. It'll go from my local PBX to the Cisco box uh, via SIP. You go from the Cisco box to the patent via T1, and then I go to the patent via IP and Telnet to the actual bulletin board. Uh, now, as you can see, these ghetto rigged black lines here that are just kind of strewn everywhere, uh, they're not straight lines by any means. This is the best way I could figure it out quickly. Uh, I could connect my ATA directly to a v VOIP provider. Uh, I'm going to give Jared some hardware, and I think I'm going to have him try to do this, but he's going to have to get his own VOIP provider, or I'd have to make him account that's only local on one of my either cloud PBX or local PBX. But if you're connecting to this, you would start here at the VOIP provider. Uh, you would skip the cloud PBX. Uh, so so out of curiosity, the how same much time, I can see. What's that? Out of curiosity, how much latency does this actually uh, add? making this massive grand tour of the internet multiple times over. <laughs> you, you'd think it would take a lot, but I mean, 
it's still a hundred milliseconds tops uh, so long as you're not maxing out the connection. And that's, I mean, my ping to the internet is 10 to 50 anyway. Right. So that's about normal. Here you have uh, uh, the problem the latency comes from uh, re-encoding the stuff. So long as you're using ULAW across the entire gap, it should just be copying it instead of trying to re-encode it, uh, thus not introducing any latency. Uh, but yeah, you can see here, I can connect this little box, uh, my ATA box that my modems are connected to. I could connect it straight to my local uh, phone box here as well, uh, skipping the internet in its complete entirety. I did that for a little while for testing purposes to try to uh, try to rule out any of this section of the network here as being the problem. Uh, and at the same time, how I originally designed this was for the local PBX to connect straight to the patent box. It actually works better with the Cisco box in between though. Uh, I think the Cisco box is just better at emulating T1 being an enterprise device versus my uh, my local PBX having having that Digium card in it. And I don't know if the card is real. It could be a clone. I got it for like 150 bucks. And if you go look them up online, like just the echo cancellation module is 150 bucks. So maybe I got a good deal on it. Maybe I bought a Chinese clone. I don't know. But I would say that this Cisco box emulates T1 significantly better. But the problem is, is the Cisco box is outdated as, as, as yeah, it's very outdated. Uh, and I would not want to connect this thing over the internet to anything by a SIP. So it's using the local PBX as kind of an intermediary, a proxy uh, to make sure that everything's up to date once it exits, the egress is the network out into the public side of the internet. Uh, but yeah, then the patent goes uh, telling that BBS, yeah. So some other stuff what I'd like to consider, I'll go back to this demo screen here in a second. Uh, some other stuff I'd like to consider though is codex, talking about codex in depth, uh, pulse code modulation. Uh, they get kind of crazy when it gets into compression and then vocoders are a whole different story altogether. Uh, Jared probably knows a little bit about that from ham radio, but uh, vocoders are taking like the kind of speech like ah, e, ah, ooh, and then recreating that on the other side. It's not actually sending your voice. It's just recreating it by, by the way of vocal, you know, sounds. Uh, that's some crazy stuff. I'd love to talk about it more, but uh or any of this other stuff. Uh, pro the actual protocols of T1, the protocols of, uh, of modems or ethernet or VOIP or amateur radio or any of that stuff is of interest to me. Uh, the bulletin boards themselves are a whole nother world to jump into, just completely a whole nother world. Uh, and then building asterisks from store source, uh, that probably took me two, three weeks to complete. So that's another story. Uh, I'd like to get on at some point in time. So let's see here if I can figure out how to switch my share from this screen to a different screen. You need to stop recording. So is this the point you want to stop recording then? Uh, yes, this is the point that I would like to stop recording. That is correct. Right. 